everyone. Okay, recording in progress. Uh, welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, to have with us uh, Professor Klaus Kiefer. Uh, the title of this, his talk is Time in Quantum Cosmology. Klaus, please begin your talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Jotek, um, for the invitation. Of course, I'm always happy to give a talk um, in, in Warsaw and uh, in other Polish places. Unfortunately, these days it's um, by Zoom and no longer um, by visiting you and your group. I, I remember the nice days I had in Warsaw. The last one was 2018 um, before Corona. Now, but anyway, we can meet by Zoom and I've I have a talk here on time in quantum cosmology. So I should say, I mean, this is certainly a wide topic and I, uh, it's not my intention in this talk to present a review of all possible uh, approaches. It's more or less a, maybe a focused work that of course takes into account my own um, contributions and, uh, and, and, and some particular aspects, but I'm happy in the discussion of course to say more. So um, now, okay, it had worked before, but for some reason now I cannot continue. Who, who was the person who could help me? Um, uh, I cannot Zetek, switch. Could you help us, please? Um, yes, I, I think you need to stop sharing for a moment and make yeah, it again. And, re, and reopening. Yeah. Okay. Now it works. I do not know if, if for some minutes no, nothing happens, then it's freezes. Okay, so now it seems to work and I have these four sections. Um, of course, there is what we call the problem of time in quantum gravity and I'm um, carefully distinguishing the classical version and the quantum version. So I will start with the classical version, introduce then quantum gravity and then go to the quantum version, which I apply to quantum cosmology. Um, at the end, I hope I have time, <laughs> seminar time. At the end, I will talk about the origin of the direction of time in quantum cosmology. Yeah, so of course, very basic, just one slide. Of course, we have Newtonian concepts of space and time, and uh, they are absolute, which means uh, non-dynamical. They're just the arena on which the physical fields act. And um, so we have a um, an objective foliation of space time into three dimensional hypersurfaces. And uh, to quote Newton himself in English translation, he wrote absolute true and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equally without relation to anything external and by other name is called duration and the same holds for absolute space. Its own nature without relation to anything external remains always similar and immovable. Now a big jump, of course, to the modern gravitational theory, which is general relativity and Einsteinian gravity. And um, now more than 100 years ago, he presented uh, his uh, field equations. Uh, 1915 was um, without the cosmological constants, but this was introduced two years later. I mean, the left-hand side, which he later called the marble side, is the geometric side and the right-hand side which is uh, he called uh, the timber uh, side is the matter and energy side in the standard notation. So uh, in principle on the right hand side, you would have to put all known fields of nature because they all can serve as a source of gravity, uh, at least the standard model of particle physics. Now, um, general relativity has a property that uh, is usually called background independence. Uh, so which is the contrast between Einstein and Newton. So there's no, no um, non-dynamical background. And Einstein himself has formulated it as follows in the English version. It is contrary to the scientific mode of understanding to postulate a thing that acts, but which cannot be acted upon. Yeah, so actio and reactio. So you just do not have a fixed space time. Um, if you have energy, then the space-time also reacts. So there are no absolute fields in general relativity and no background structure. Yeah, so here that's a sketch of um, what plays roles in the, role in the following, the three plus one decomposition. So you can 
understand, I mean, the dynamics of general relativity as the dynamics of three geometries. You know, going back to Anuvete, Samisna, uh, and Wheeler, and others. So you don't necessarily have to solve space time um, equations at once. You can have a three metric that evolves from one hypersurface to the next one. And of course, this is arbitrary. Um, you can have these labs and shift functions that specify, I mean, how the foliation is made and how the coordinates on the three surface um, are, are, are done. Now, um, writing general relativity in canonical form, this has taken many years and uh, it's an interesting story, but I will not, of course, present the technical details, just to mention that Einstein's equations can be written as a dynamical system uh, for the three-dimensional metric and which is called here HAB, um, coordinates uh, values and uh, the canonical momentum on a space-like hypersurface. Now, Einstein equations, these are 10 equations, but out of them four are uh, constraints, which are restrictions on this, uh, the, the possible values of HAB and PAB on the three surface. And the remaining six then give you the dynamical evolution from one hypersurface to the next. Now, these are the four constraints. Um, uh, if you don't have seen them before, um, of course, they look a little bit complicated, but uh, they can be understood nicely. So the first is the Hamiltonian constraint, and the three others are called momentum or diffeomorphism constraints. They are local constraints, so they hold at each space point. So in principle, these are infinitely many. Now you see you have here the, um, the pi squared terms here, which is like in mechanics, p squared. And so this is the kinetic term, and you also have a potential term, which only depends on the three metric and its derivatives. Um, it's not only pi squared, you have this in front, um, these coefficients, which depend on the three metric introduced by Price DeWitt in 1967, and it's called DeWitt metric. No? So in a sense, it's a, a metric on the space of metrics. Kappa is eight pi times the gravitational constant over speed of light to the fourth power. And you see you have here kappa, here one over kappa. This is three-dimensional Ricci scalar, the determinant of the three metric, the cosmological constant. And of course, we don't have uh, just empty space time. We have here also uh, matter and energy, and this is indicated here by this row, um, the T0, zero, zero component of the stress energy. Uh, here, the momentum constraints, they look a little bit simpler. You have here just the three-dimensional covariant derivative of the, of the momenta, and you have these currents of matter, which for example, electrodynamics would be the pointing vector. Okay, so that's the, the arena. Um, so the rewriting of the full covariant Einstein equations um, into a three plus one form. And there is a nice interconnection between these constraints and the evolution. So, so they are not really independent. Um, so there are theorems one can prove, and I only quote these theorems. So these constraints, they should hold on, 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 on any hypersurface, of course, right? On any three-dimensional hypersurface. So they are preserved in time, yeah. However you foliate it. And one can show that this is equivalent to the fact that the energy momentum tensor on the right-hand side has vanishing covariant divergence. Um, so, uh, which we know from relativity, of course, but you see here the connection to the constraints. In electrodynamics, we have something similar. The Gauss constraints is preserved in time. And this is equivalent to charge conservation. So you see how important these conservation laws are. The second theorem states that Einstein's equations are the unique propagation law consistent with the constraints. So if you, if you have this foliation and on each hypersurface you have the constraint, then you can proceed from one to the other only by the remaining six Einstein equations. You cannot do uh, otherwise, right? So you really need uh, I mean, all 10 Einstein equations. So in electrodynamics, the analog is that Maxwell's equations are the unique propagation law consistent with the Gauss constraint. And the Gauss constraint, nafla E is rho, valid on each hypersurface, uh, means that from one to the other hypersurface, you have to go with Maxwell equations. Now, problem of time part one um, is the classical problem. It's not always in the literature 
distinguish between classical and quantum, but I uh, want to emphasize that it's important. So if we, for simplicity, restrict to compact three-dimensional surface, otherwise we have to deal with boundary terms, which one can do, but which would be a bit too much for the talk. Um, the total Hamiltonian is a combination of the pure constraints and all the evolution, in a sense, will be generated by the constraint in the sense of this theorems. And there is no external time parameter. Yeah? So you just everything is within space time uh, and this hypersurface. And all physical time parameters are to be constructed from within. That is as functional of the canonical variables. So from the beginning, there is no preferred choice of such an intrinsic time parameter. Um, there's always a discussion about what are observables. And unless you want to discuss it in, in, at the end, I want to be brief here because people have discussed that observables should commute with the constraints, but then you have no dynamics. If you commute with the Hamiltonian constraint, then you commute with the Hamiltonian. So nothing goes on. Uh, uh, in fact, a more, more recent point of view is that it should commute with a gauge generator that is a certain sum of all constraints. Also, uh, what we call the primary constraints, which have to do with lapse and shift. But that would be perhaps a bit outside my, my talk. So the absence of an intrin extrinsic time and the non-preference of an intrinsic one is what I want to call the problem of time in the classical theory. But I emphasize that space-time still exists. Huh? We are in classical relativity. And this will be different in the quantum theory. Now, to motivate quantum gravity or, yeah, would be a long story. And uh, um, I would perhaps have to tell uh, many things. Uh, I like to prefer also in, the, in, in my lecture course to quote Feynman's um, Gedanken experiment from 1957 which he um, presented at the famous meeting, a Chapel Hill meeting in the US, where maybe the first modern meeting in a sense on relativity and gravitation. Um, so we have this Jan Gellar type of experiment. I think the standard way has been one half particle and an inhomogeneous magnetic field. So if the field points up, um, the beam is reflected upwards. If the field points down, reflected downwards. But if um, you have to spin in, in, say, to the right. Then you have a superposition um, uh, of, of up and down. And so Feynman imagines that you have here a connection with a macroscopic object, a small ball, uh, so that if the counter one makes click, the ball moves upwards. And counter two makes click, the ball moves downwards. And if you have a superposition, you would have, in principle, ball up and ball down in a superposition. But the ball has a noticeable gravitational field. And so you would have to superpose the gravitational field. And Feynman argues then you would need quantum gravity. In his own words, if you believe in quantum mechanics up to any level, then you have to believe in gravitational quantization in order to describe this experiment. It may turn out, since we have never done experiment at this level, that it's not possible. That there's something that matter with our quantum mechanics when you have too much action in the system or too much mass or something. But that is the only way I can see which would keep you from the necessity of quantizing the gravitational field. It's a way I don't want to propose. OK, there are certainly people who want to propose, like Roger Penrose, um, who believes in classical gravity. But uh, the majority of people, um, I would say, is uh, towards the quantization of gravity. Of course, which approach? There are many approaches, and John Wheeler wants remarked, no question about quantum gravity is more difficult than the question, what is the question or say, what is the correct approach? I mean, what are the questions that lead you to the final theory? And um, the main approaches are quantum general relativity. We just apply some quantum rules to Einstein's theory. You could also apply it to other classical theories. Um, and string theory, which I will not enter here at all, and there are also interesting fundamental discrete approaches, which I also will not enter at all. In quantum general relativity, still we can distinguish between covariant approaches and canonical approaches. And the covariant ones, they are usually these days the ones where you use path integrals or generalization known as spin forms and so on. I will restrict to the canonical approach and in particular to geometrical dynamics. But this does not mean that you cannot discuss what I do in the other approaches. So this I skip. 
and uh, canonical quantum gravity. You can also um, formulate a canonical quantum formalism in different ways. And uh, I later will briefly mention the reduced approach, but here I want to really choose the Iraq quantization approach. And this is very formal and shorthand notation that you take all the constraints, you turn them into operators uh, by some rules and uh, apply them on, on wave functional and this uh, gives zero. Uh, you will see this explicitly. Um, of course, it depends which variables you use and the oldest is just using the metric, the three-dimensional metric and it's the pi AB that I had used earlier and they're related to the extrinsic curvature. And this is called geometrodynamics. You can also use uh, other variables to make a classically a mixture of P's and Q's. So these are the connection and the uh, canonical variable which resemble young Mills type of fields. Um, these are the Ashtika variables introduced in 86 out of which crew loop quantum gravity where you instead of A and E you have the flux of E and you have the holonomy. Now I don't derive these quantum equations but I can um, give you a short cut to, um, to this derivation. Namely, you arrive at these equations, these quantum equations, when you apply a procedure that Schrödinger already applied in 1926 to mechanics. You know? So what he did do at that time, he wanted to find a wave equation because the boy had come up with this um, um, Meta wave dualism, and uh, he rewrote classical mechanics into Hamilton Jacobi form. And then Schrodinger was very good in optics. He could uh, devise wave equations that give back in the geometric optics limits the mechanics. Uh, in his own words, we know today, in fact, that our classical mechanics fails for very small dimensions of the past and for very great curvatures. Perhaps this failure is in strict analogy with the failure of geometric optics. It becomes evident as soon as the obstacles or apertures are no longer great compared with the real finite wavelengths. Then it becomes a question of searching for undulatory mechanics and the most obvious ways by an elaboration of the Hamiltonian analogy on the lines of undulatory optics. And this is how he found the Schrodinger equation, which then opened actually the, the door to um, quantum mechanics. And if you follow the same, I, same formalism uh, and apply it to Einstein's equation, then you arrive at these equations that you see on that slide, which is uh, mainly the Wheeler de Witt equation, uh, which substitutes the Schrodinger equation and which is a field theoretic equation. So, no longer a quantum mechanical equation. So, perhaps you remember the constraints I had before. Maybe I can show you here. Um, yeah, the classical constraints. So, you, you substitute a pi by h bar over i, the derivative with respect to the three metric. And uh, here also I apply this to wave functions psi and uh, set, it, set it equal to zero. Oops, sorry, I was too far. And then you get this long equation called the wheeler de Witt equation. Of course, it's a formal equation um, because I would have to say much about what these functional derivatives mean. And um, later we do quantum cosmology and there uh, the situation is much simpler. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the quantum version of um, Hamiltonian constraint. And we also have the quantum diffeomorphism or momentum constraint, uh, HA psi equals zero, which basically uh, can interpret it as follows. It means that psi does not change if you make a coordinate transformation on the three dimensional slide, the one that is connected to the identity. Now, what you see here on the right hand side, and what maybe is shocking at first glance, is this zero. So there is no, uh, no time parameter present. So no time t as in Schrodinger equation. And John Wheeler explained why here on the blackboard. So in classical mechanics, you have this trajectory, and in addition, you have the time t. In quantum mechanics, the trajectory is gone, but uh, um, you only have, have the Q's and you have a wave function of Q's, but in addition, you have still T in quantum mechanics. The absolute T is there, but in Einstein's theory, um, this already is the whole space time. There's no additional T outside space time. So if you quantize here, 
you just have um, the collection of three geometries and no additional t. So this is why time is gone. It is gone because space time is gone. Um, so we have here, well, in this recent um, essay with uh, Patrick Peter from Paris, which is also cited in the abstract. So we have taken that this table from Misnoson and Wheeler and, okay, reformulated it a little bit. So it's not the same, it has been adapted. Uh, but it's very nice in, in Misnoson and Wheeler, nicely explained the comparison between geometrodynamics and particle dynamics. So geometrodynamics, particle dynamics, of course, here we have space as, as the dynamics with the three geometry. And here this would call upon the, the particle and this would be the trajectory. And the classical description would be H of T, the four geometry here, it's X of T. But uh, in, in the quantum theory, of course, space time is gone. So all, all what we have is psi of uh, the three, three metric which the space of three metrics we are called super space. And here, of course, we have space time. And uh, that's the difference between here. No? We have space time, but here uh, space time has gone. So, so the result may be shocking absence of, of time and so on. But in a sense, it's a very straightforward conclusion just that you get when you apply standard recipes of quantization. Of course, this recipe can be wrong when applied to gravity, we don't know. But if you're conservative and you apply them, this is what you arrive. And this is what um, Wheeler and David, and even earlier, um, Dirac and ADM and Bergman um, investigated. Now this comes to, brings me to the problem of time part two, which is the quantum version. So you see the external time has vanished completely from the formalism. Um, there's no, long, no longer a space time where we could perhaps choose some time parameter. It has vanished from the formalism. Um, this also holds for loop quantum gravity. We have different variables, but it's also a canonical theory and uh, probably for string theory, but there I would need much more discussion. Uh, it's not special for relativity because it holds for any theory that has no absolute time at a classical level. Uh, so uh, the point is here that uh, here in, in classical mechanics, we have absolute T and the absolute T of course remains. But if you have a classical theory without absolute time, even if it's not general relativity, maybe brand sticky or whatever, then, um, you, then the T vanishes. Um, the Willard David equation itself has a structure of a wave equation. I did not um, discuss that. I just tell you this has to do with this David metric. So if you study the structure of this kinetic term, it has a, a, a signatures of minus plus 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 plus. So like a Glenn Gordon equation. And then this has to do with this David metric. This is what I mean here, the structure of a wave equation in the standard form. And of course there is one variable that has a different sign and I can call it an intrinsic time. Because this intrinsic time is constructed from the three metric, it's not something from other uh, variables, but um, it can be defined. Um, in quantum mechanics, as you know, the Hilbert space structure is very important and it's connected with the probability interpretation, in particular with the probability conservation in time t. Um, now, what happens with this if there is no time t? Um, what happens with this structure in a timeless situation? Um, do we still need it? Do we have to replace it? Let me just put this here as a question. Um, I should say that although I discussed this in geometrodynamics and in um, the canonical approach, it also applies to the pass integral approach. Why? Because one can show at least formally, if you don't care about this field theoretic subtleties formally, that the pass integral is solved by the quantum constraint. Now, like in quantum mechanics, if you recall Feynman's pass integral, um, uh, it satisfies Schrodinger's equation. And uh, also here, this part, part in which satisfies the Wheeler degree. So you could also claim that what I say here is not a specialty of the canonical picture. You can use the, canon the covariant picture as well. Um, yeah, this I already remarked before. Um, here, maybe a bit more careful with string theory, which is here, a theory of emergent gravity and um, 
has also consequence about on space, not only time. Again, um, the issue with the observables I mentioned in the classical context, and uh, most likely you have to do the same in the quantum version. You have this sum of the constraints, um, which is a quantum gauge generator, and your observables should commute in the sense of the um, quantum commutation. Now, um, my, my actual topic is quantum cosmology. And um, so let me enter that. Um, of course, one could go on just discussing these concepts in general, but the advantage here is that you um, can temporarily forget about the mathematical problems and you can really focus on the conceptual problems. Um, because uh, in cosmology, we typically only have very few um, parameters like uh, the scale factor of a Friedman universe and some matter degrees of, of freedom. So um, instead of quantum field theory, you have just quantum mechanics or quantum gravitation mechanics. And here we, we, we choose a closed Friedman lemmata universe with a scale factor A and a homogeneous, homogeneous massive scalar field phi. We uh, not long ago called this drastic restriction then a mini superspace, in a superspace space of all three metrics mini if you restrict to very few degrees of freedom, particularly here there are no gravitational waves and nothing. So classically you would have this metric um, minus n squared t squared, so that's a lapse function. You can use whatever t you like. You can redefine t to t prime. And the important thing is this part where you have the scale factor and the three-dimensional line element. Now, the wheeler wit equation in this case reads as follows. The other constraints, they are identically satisfied. I don't have to take care for them. So if I use particular units here for the gravitational constant, then the wheeler wit equation reads like that. And you see you have just a wave function psi of a and phi. And you have the kinetic term and the potential term. And the factor ordering is chosen in a convenient way. You see here the indefinite form. It's really like a Glenn Gordon equation. This here comes with a plus, and this here comes with a minus. So in principle, you can solve this equation in some cases analytically, uh, but at least numerically. Um, concerning time, there is an important difference between the classical theory and the quantum theory that you can discuss here. Um, so I call it this determinism in classical and quantum theory. So if you had the classical theory first, in configuration space, so you have two-dimensional mini superspace, and uh, you have a model where you have an expanding and recollapsing universe. Of course, this direction is arbitrary. It would also go from here to here, but the point is that this trajectory exists. So you can, for example, give initial conditions here and calculate, and this can be considered as the recollapsing yeah, so this recollapsing part is a deterministic success of the expansion, expanding part. But not so in the quantum theory. There is no longer this trajectory. If you, for example, want to calculate a wave packet that is concentrated here, um, then you have to solve the wave equation. And the wave equation is a, a hyper hyperbolic equation. So you typically give here initial values here. So you would have to give here the wave packet and here a wave packet and then solve from small a to large a, not along the trajectory, but from small a to large a. So in a sense, you must put this recollapsing part into the initial conditions, yeah, which is very strange from the classical intuition. But if you look at the quantum equation, this is what you have to do. So the recollapsing wave packet, in some sense, must be present initially, initially with respect to a. And there's no intrinsic difference between Big Bang and Big Crunch because they are the same region in configuration space. So these are classic, classical concepts. Yeah, so long ago, I have uh, done some calculations. For example, here, this simple model, the indefinite oscillator, um, which you can calculate analytically, of course. And uh, the classical trajectory are ellipses. These are, these are true ellipses in configuration space. And one can, following the previous transparency, one by giving initial conditions here, um, these two wave packets, I can calculate a superposition of two uh, in of two ellipses as wave packets, right? So in the so the evolution goes from small a to larger, right? but there is no classical trajectory where you can say no. I start here 
and T grows and T grows and I end up here. That, that's no longer the case. Now, um, how, I mean, now you are lost because um, um, time has disappeared. Um, so independent of say the full concept of time and quantum gravity, you should at least be able to recover the standard time, which is a time of relativity and quantum mechanics. And this uh, can be done and uh, has been done um, already long ago. And um, to sum it up, you can expand, make an expansion of the wheel to the equation with respect to the Planck mass, um, like a Ligerborn Oppenheimer approximation molecular physics. And you get a functional Schrodinger equation for the non gravitational field in a space time that is a solution of Einstein equations. Yeah. And time emerges then um, as a semi classical approximate WKB type of concept, yeah, because then only in the WKB limit, you can again talk about trajectories like in geometric optics, and you can parameterize them uh, by uh, this WKB time. And in this same limit, of course, you have the usual Hilbert space structure and the usual probability interpretation. So at least the standard concepts you can derive in an appropriate limit, independent of what happens at a full level. Yeah, so you can also go to the next order. Um, this would be a separate talk and uh, also related to my own work. So you can, you have this Schrodinger equation for the matter part, and you can the next order discuss, derive your various terms with one over Planck mass squared, which gives you quantum gravitational corrections. Um, you can calculate them, uh, how they enter energy, how they shift energy values or how they modify the power spectrum of the CMB uh, anisotropies. So yeah, so you don't have to look at these references. So we have done work on that over the years and calculate corrections. Unfortunately, because of the one over Planck mass square term, the corrections are, are very small. They are so tiny that you cannot see them by the Planck satellite. You know, so you can calculate concrete numbers. That's nice because you can get definite predictions from quantum gravity, but so far they are just too small. Now, um, let me enter something else that has to do with, with the concept of time, uh, namely the quantum to classical transition. And this is related to what one calls here, but of course in standard quantum mechanics, uh, it's more popular the coherence yeah, because if you have a quantum gravity, then of course you have metric is quantum and you can consider a superposition of um, different geometries. You know? That's what I have written here in quantum cosmology, arbitrary superpositions of the gravitational field and matter sticks. And so how can we understand the emergence of an approximate classical universe? Yeah, that's at, at least for people working in quantum gravity, it's an issue because they don't want to assume classicality from the beginning. They want to derive classicality. But of course, for, for observational astronomy, that's um, usually just given that you have classical um, universe. Um, that's uh, some more details, sorry for that. Uh, but just to tell you how this is done in the formalism. So we have to do the width equation. So this H naught was what I had before, just the A and phi. And now, of course, I had I have to do it a bit more uh, realistic. So I have to introduce inhomogeneities, which you anyway use to need to um, describe gravitational waves and uh, density perturbations. And in if, if if they are small, and that's what is used here, so they don't interact with each other, only with the background. You can write here this as a sum of some Hamiltonians that depend on a and phi, but in addition on on um, the separate modes. No? So this N is very formal. You could write uh, a K, a wave number. No? So each wavelength um, and enters one definite HN. This is this a very symbolic notation here. Actually, Halliwell and Hawking in 1985, they, in a, in a, in a seminal paper, they introduced this and dis discussed this. So if if um, we make an ansatz here for the, for the solution, a psi naught and a, a product of all psi n, because there is a sum, so you can have a product solution. 
Uh, and if you assume that psi naught is of this WPD form, then you really can derive for each psi n this Schrodinger type of equation, i h bar d psi n, the t is h n psi n, and the d over dt is now what I called previously the WPP time. It's defined by nabla of this S0 nabla. So it gives you um, S0 uh, obeys the Hamilton Jacobi equation. So you get this formal um, space time, so light rays, if you like, in the analogy. And you can parameterize this, and this is what brings you in the T. So the T is something approximate. Now, decoherence means typically you have many degrees of freedom, but only some of them are relevant that you focus on. And these relevant degrees of freedom here, I call the system. Uh, I take the mini superspace, the scale factor, and the inflaton. And the environment, these are unobservable small things like the density fluctuations or the gravitational waves. Actually, um, C and I long ago, actually, in my PhD thesis. Uh, I introduced this concept to quantum cosmology, this decoherence and make calculations. Uh, here's one example, um, just this one result, which I did with uh, my colleagues later. Uh, in this early paper, I, because we have infinitely many wavelengths, I just made a cutoff at a Planck scale. So it depends on that Planck cutoff, but later um, we, we thought about a regularization um, where no cutoff enters. And if you have, say, the scale factor of a semi classical De Sitter universe, H is the upper parameter of inflation, uh, and you have tensorial modes, which are called gravitons, then um, I can have decoherence. So I calculate a reduced density matrix, which um, without gravitational, without the gravitons, would just psi star psi of A here only. But this decoherence to trace out this um, graviton to get a, a suppression factor, a, a pseudo Gaussian, which suppresses interferences between A and A prime. And this is the decoherence. So, and you see here the size uh, of this becomes smaller and smaller. And so, if A increases, so the universe actually assumes classical properties uh, at the beginning of inflation. Um, you can also instead of just having, say, an e to the i s, as I did before, have the e to the i s and superpose it with its complex conjugate. Yeah, This would be a kind of Schrodinger cat state. And what happens there? Now, in molecular physics, we know what happens. So in molecular physics, this would correspond to the superposition of different chiral states, as, as it's usual in um, for sugar molecules. For example, here, this is maybe ammonia and uh, standard notation of this double well potential. So the crown state, the first excited state. Um, but what we observe for the, at least the complex molecules, not the ammonia, is that either the state is left or right. Yeah, so it's in the superposition of the two. And uh, we can understand this in, in modern physics by decoherence through scattering by light or air molecules. And the same happens in uh, quantum cosmology, the decoherence between this and, and this, which would be together, would be a non-classical universe. I mean, a Schrodinger cat type universe, but they decohere. So you can focus on this or the other, like you can focus here on left or right. And um, you can justify, except for very small universes, the classicality of the universe. That, that's just some number, which is maybe not relevant here. Now, once this is done, you can also address, say, the origin of structure in the universe. Now. According to uh, um, modern cosmology, many people believe there was an inflationary phase, so a phase of uh, rapid quasi exponential expansion. Um, and there were primordial quantum fluctuations, and these quantum fluctuations turned classical and became stochastic and served as the seeds of uh, galaxies. Now, of course, how do they become classical? I and mean, if you start with quantum, in principle, you remain quantum. Um, so again, here, the process of um, decoherence is crucial, and I don't bring this in in my talk, so I have no formula here, but in a couple of papers with uh, David Polaski and Alexis Dautinsky, we discussed that and showed how, and also in which limits this is done. Now, the fluctuations, they turn out, behave as uh, classical stochastic quantities, and then are then 
um, equipped to serve as seeds for the structure in the universe. Yeah. So you see quantum gravity is uh, really needed to um, understand also the origin of structure in the sense because among these, these um, bimodal fluctuations, oops, these bimodal fluctuations are also metric fluctuations. Yeah, okay, a famous picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is what comes out of these primordial quantum fluctuations if they had turned classical and evolved then into um, galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Um, interpretation of quantum cosmology is a subtle issue. And maybe if you discuss with different people, you will certainly get different points of view. Um, but what I, being very careful here, what I want to emphasize is that both quantum general relativity and string theory, they preserve the linear structure of the quantum state. So they don't implement things, for example, as, as Roger Penrose as suggests these nonlinearities in the quantum version. Um, so you have still the validity of the superposition principle. Actually, this is what I needed to discuss the coherence. So how can we interpret this? Um, so De Witt in 1967, he advocated the average point of view. So average view of the world, this is a quote, is a very natural one. He said to adopt in the quantum theory of gravity when one is accustomed to speak without embarrassment of the wave function of the universe. It is possible that average view is not only natural, but uh, essential. Yeah. Um, of course, um, this is not the only interpretation. And uh, there's certainly, uh, for example, my colleague Patrick Peter uh, in the paper advocates the deploy boom version. You can also advocate so-called collapse theories and others. I should also mark on reduced approaches of quantum gravity, which I have not included here because I have I had not worked on them where you solve classically the constraints and you have maybe some time from the reduced approach, for example, to discuss good algebras and especially um, you know, people in the audience, so, so Vladek, um, also um, <coughs> Markiewicz worked on this uh, reduced approaches and, and at time, I mean, from this reduced equations. No? So these are approaches by the full level, no? independent of this recovery of the semi-classical time. Um, it has advantages, for example, of course, with respect to the Hilbert space problem. No? Um, okay, the last thing is the direction of time, and this is, of course, symbolized by this uh, still life of Paul Cezanne, that we have an arrow of time that points from past to future, and you have this increase of entropy, and uh, yeah, can we understand this, say, from a theory that is timeless, <laughs> fundamentally? So you might say, say this is nonsense. You cannot get the error of time maybe from timeless quantum gravity. But let's have a look. Um, so uh, many people have studied this. And uh, I think there is some consensus that the error of time that we observe should somehow be rooted in cosmology. Why? Because we, have, we are far away from thermal equilibrium. We um, don't have a global temperature. We have, say, hot spots like the sun and stars. And um, so, where the, so the question arises where the sun comes from. I mean, life relies on the sun. No? You have Roger Penrose has explained this nicely in his book about the emperor's new mind that um, you have very few uh, low, uh, high energy photons coming from the sun. and very many low energy photons with much higher entropy leaving um, than the Earth in, in empty space, um, increasing the entropy of the universe. And this is only possible because you can do that. You have this empty space where all these many photons can disappear. Um, already Schrödinger in his book, What is Life, has mentioned that. Uh, very nice and, and still, still interesting book, uh, he emphasizes, of course, that um, main, we eat mainly to keep entropy low and not to um, get energy because energy is conserved. And um, we, I mean, at least on average, of course, we keep our energy level <laughs> and don't increase in size. So it's about the entropy. So where does the sun come from? Well, according to cosmology, it comes from the gravitational instability of dust clouds, and this is cosmology. And already in the 19th century, Lord Ludwig Boltzmann, in his Nature article, he wrote that in nature, the transition from a probable to an improbable state does not happen equally often as the opposite transition should be 
sufficiently explained by the assumption of a very improbable initial state of the whole universe surrounding it. So Boltzmann wanted to put it into the initial state as an initial state of low entropy. And then of course, once you have that, the second law applies and entropy increases. Of course, in 1898, one could only imagine um, a static universe. And so um, Boltzmann imagined uh, just a, a very unlike fluctuation that brought, um, well, quite, he introduced the fluctuations into statistical mechanics. So he imagined this uh, very unlike fluctuation where you get very low entropy from which then the increase in entropy follows. Of course, in modern terms, we have a big bang, we have an evolving universe. How special is the universe in terms of entropy? Perhaps you know this um, estimate by Penrose in 81, which I have uh, some time updated to use also um, the accelerating universe and the cosmological constant, and um, which was not used here, but the argument is the same. So he had uh, the entropy of the universe compared to the maximal possible one. And uh, so how do you get the entropy of the universe? Of course, he means the observable universe, not up to the particle horizon. And uh, so um, if you restrict to non-gravitational degrees of freedom, the maximum is the um, CMB or the CMB photons, but this is much lower than that. So I use this number, which is the sum of all supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies, according to the bekenstein hawking formula. But the maximal one would be, according to Penrose, if everything is within one gigantic black hole. And uh, this is a much bigger number. So like, whatever you put here in the numerator, the denominator, I mean, wins. And you can neglect this and you get this amazingly tiny number, which is of course something ad hoc, but the, it, it, it's to the point because it um, gives you, I mean, a puzzle. Yeah? How can you understand such a small number, if at all? Now, Penrose came up with this wild curvature hypothesis. He said, okay, um, the wild curvature vanishes at all past singularities. So it's very homogeneous. And then it becomes inhomogeneous. No? Um, um, for that, there's this picture, which uh, is based on his ideas. I mean, you have the smooth Big Bang, and if the universe collapses, which probably will not do, but if it does, you have this very inhomogeneous big crunch. And so entropy is very low here, if you from think in terms of mild tensor, but it's very big here. Now, um, recently uh, in an essay, um, in honor of uh, Penrose's Nobel Prize of Special Collection, I formulated a quantum version of that. Uh, because if you're having quantum gravity, um, you have this you have the uncertainty relation, and you cannot just put everything to zero. I mean, you have quantities and their their um, canonical partners. So what I formulated was the quantum states for the wild scalars that describe scalar and tensor modes. They assume the form of the adiabatic vacuum state. That's what people in inflationary cosmology usually um, assume in a quasi-decitor space as the region of small enough scale factors that approach from future direction. So you start with um, some Gaussians like the ground state of the harmonic oscillator for these tensor modes and scalar modes and to put them as initial conditions and then you get uh, entangled states. And in, in a sense, you get an increase of quantum and quantum entropy. This is only sketched here. Uh, I have not done really a, a mathematically rigorous calculation yet about that. But if you write down the wheeler witt equation, uh, instead of alpha A, I use alpha, which is the logarithm of A. And so alpha goes from minus infinity to infinity. And uh, you have all these inhomogeneities and you have this potential that couples them. Uh, it's very uh, interesting to see that this potential becomes very um, simple if you approach the Big Bang alpha to minus because it's just zero and you just have the free wave equation. So it's compatible with a simple boundary condition. All the degrees of freedom are unentangled, just a product state. So whatever entropy you calculate by cross graining is just zero. But of course, if uh, alpha increases, uh, universe is bigger, then you have this potential, you have an entangled state and uh, if you trace out in homogeneities, then you get, of course, an entropy, say the von Neumann entropy or another entropy um, that is increasing. 
And so you could say that this defines the direction of time now. So it's not that the universe by itself uh, expands. You could say this would define a direction and this you call the expansion. So you expand of the universe in this fundamental sense could be just a tautology. Um, that uh, refers to an old paper that I did with C. Um, so that's the Penrose version, which I showed before. And if you do the quantum cosmology version, then I, I think many slides ago, I argued that Big Bang and Big Crunch are actually the same because in, in the quantum theory, you cannot distinguish between them because they both just refer to small a. But there's no T that is small here or not, it's just the A. So you would have to bring this into a time symmetric picture, which we did at that time, which uh, has very weird consequences. So um, maybe another shock for you um, that then would have been that the error of time would reverse at the turning point. But uh, it's not that then, I mean, the fallen down glasses would, would come up again, um, because anyway, um, that's one can show that this is a quantum region. So all these classical branches, they just interfere destructively here. And, and so the classical world is gone and the same happens from here to here. So at least it, this may be wrong because we don't know the final quantum equations, but if we stick to this wheeler de Witt and other equations or loops, and then it's a consequence, right? even if it's a bizarre consequence. Now I'm approaching the end in uh, our usual seminar and semi-classical time. <laughs> and uh, I, I like uh, to quote here these pioneers, uh, John Wheeler and Bryce DeWitt. So John Wheeler uh, wrote these considerations reveal that the concepts of space, time and time itself are not primary, but secondary ideas in the structure of physical theory. These concepts are valid in the classical approximation. However, they have neither meaning nor application under circumstances when quantum geometric dynamics become important. That's then the genuine quantum gravity regime. Yeah. Where, for example, we discuss singularity avoidance and these things which I have omitted in my talk. There's no space time, there's no time, there's no before, there's no after. The question of happens next is without meaning. I mean, fundamentally, I think for us here in the seminar, we know what happens next. Uh, David, and uh, in proceedings, he wrote, um, one learns the time and probability are both phenomenological concepts. He means that they can be derived in a certain limit and they hold there, but in the fundamental equations, they seem, according to David, do not have a place. Yeah, right, I mean, I have uh, in my, my book, I have of course written about that. And I think that's also what uh, Blodek suggested that I use as the background for my talk, this essay with, uh, with um, Patrick Peter, which has just, just appeared. There's also a popular book in, in German. It's, there's no English translation, but there's a Polish translation, Quantovi Cosmos, and Michael Heller was so kind for the title to, to, to provide this quote, I think, which um, you, can, you can read very well, and I don't have to, to read it here. So I thank you for this, uh, again, for this invitation, for kind attention. Sorry that I cannot see you in person in Warsaw. Um, and uh, so thank you very much again. Thank you very much indeed for your absolutely clear lecture. And now we have time for questions. Okay. Uh, further questions, comments, remarks? I hope it was not too shocking. So, so, there are... <laughs> so you're, you're uh, Patrick later. is also here, I see. Hello, uh -huh. Patrick. Patrick is here. Is Patrick, he here? hello. Patrick, are you there? Bonjour. Bonjour. Hi. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, hi. Hi, Patrick. Ah. So, uh, uh, so everything was so clear that there are no questions. So, uh, in that case, uh, let us let us uh, thank the speaker again. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.